Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. Before we get started with the episode, I want to tell you about a new ebook available on our website called Buyer Beware. Why do they keep trying to sell you that annuity? This ebook covers the various types of annuities, negatives to owning annuities, and better investment alternatives to annuities. To download this ebook, you can click the link in the episode notes or go to wiserinvestor.com and you'll find it at the bottom of the page. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith. Guiding you to financial freedom today is my co-host, Missy Beach. Hey, Missy. Hey, Casey. So today we are going to talk about um, ways to be uh, growing and uh, passing down generational wealth. And I feel like this is a, we've touched on all different angles of this, of this uh, topic. I mean, this is, this is episode 175, Missy. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> we've covered just about everything at this point, <laughs> but um, uh, we, we, you know, and I'll, I'll reference some, some podcasts here in the past. Uh, we, well, I'll go to rever- reference one is uh, if you really want to learn about uh, passing on generational wealth and how to do that, we have a great one with James uh, E. Hughes, uh, Brad and I did that interview, episode 117. What is gen- generational wealth and how do you preserve it? And James Hughes has written multiple books on the topic. Uh, and so we really focus in on 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 passing down gener- gener- generational wealth and how to do that. We'll touch on some of the highlights of that here. But I feel like a lot of clients today that we're meeting with are they have really good incomes and they're doing really well. Um and I think they are thinking about, hey, I want to make sure our kids are taken care of, that they have uh, ability to be educated at, in almost any school they want to go to, and that maybe we can start a a fund for them. Because you th- you think about, you know, I don't know what your first house cost, but my first house was, I think, less than $100,000. And, I, you know, for the young people joining our firm now to buy a house around here – probably at least a half million. Oh yeah. And you got to put down, you got to be putting down 20%, but even just 10% to come out of school and then have $50,000 that you got to put down on a, on a home. That's tough. That's crazy. Yeah. Times have changed. It's California's come here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, having, having that head start, um, you know, and I'm sure there might be some listeners that say, well, I did this on my own. They can do that on their own. But that's not how you build generational opportunity, generational generational wealth, where something's passed down. So maybe we should start by defining that. How would you define generational wealth, Missy? Well, obviously, you hear generational wealth, and I think the one name that comes to mind is Rockefeller Wealth. And that's the trap that people fall into thinking like, oh, I don't have generational wealth. I'm not a Rockefeller. But it's not just like the uber wealthy that have generational wealth. I think really the base definition is if you're not going to spend all your money during your lifetime and you're passing some on to the next generation, well, hey, that's generational wealth. Right. So... Any family, any client that has more than they could reasonably spend during his or her lifetime has generational wealth, and I would argue a duty to impart his or her wisdom to the next generation in how that money should be spent or saved or used um, to better the family, the business, the world, um, an educational institution, a cause, just whatever it might be. And, you know, accumulating to that point is, is something that if, if you say, man, I want to stop kind of like living from generation to generation, then if you're a young person listening to the podcast, you have the ability to do that. And, and it's called saving early because you have that ability to compound. Even if it's just a few thousand dollars a year that you're putting into the side account for the next generation. You're able to do that, but you have to do that and also uh, teach about uh, financial literacy, money management, right? Yeah. I mean, there, there was a, a study here that TIAA did 
of the people in this study um, could identify like loans, like how to borrow money and pay it back. But beyond that, um, they didn't they didn't do so good, like understanding the risk related to that, understanding a risk reward. Mm-hmm. They, they didn't test as well or have as much knowledge about about that. And I think that's sad because if you go way back, go into the way back time machine, you have cavemen, okay? And during the time of cavemen, like nobody had secret bank accounts. No <laughs> one was uber wealthy. Right. But like from that time period to today, like some men and women figured out how to accumulate wealth and to pass on generational wealth. So there's no reason why someone young and in the accumulation mode can't be the one in their family to begin accumulating generational wealth. So that goes back to what you just said to the young people out there. Like, okay, be that person, be that change agent in your family to begin the accumulation of generational wealth and you be the impetus and you get to decide like what it means to you and the people around you in your world. Yeah. And, and, but there's other ways you can, can, well, it's about education when, especially when they're young, but then having family meetings and telling a story Ah. and, and communicating about this is what my wishes are. And this is what I would like for you guys to get on board with. And I would think most of the time, that family members are willing to, to do that. Um, but we've had, uh, I can't remember which client it was. I just remember the story, not that we would say their name anyway, but I remember, um, a new client that came in and said, well, this is, this was from my mom and my dad and they worked really hard for this. And I just want to make sure I protect it for the next generation. And I noticed they had other siblings. I said, Oh, well, do your other siblings have advisors that they're using? And she said, Oh no, one booked private flights for like, five years <laughs> everywhere he went <laughs> and all yes. the money's gone. I was yeah. like, man, how sad is that? And so there are, um, uh, there are trusts that you can set up to help protect from s- certain things like that. Uh, and James Hughes's book, when he talks about generational wealth, um, he talks about the ability to create, um, uh, basically you eliminate the banks. So this is obviously bigger. You sold a mm-hmm. business or something mm-hmm. happened and, and so you'd have, so I have one sister. So maybe she and I were, we paired together and we put money 50, 50 into this, um, some type of a, a, of a trust account that is then there for one single purpose. And that's loaning money to the family. Mm-hmm. So you get super low interest mortgages. You get, um, someone who wants to start a business, they come and pitch it to the family and the family says, okay, I think we can, we can help you, you know, start that. Um, and so, you know, in, in his book, he also talks about a family back in, uh, World War II that the dad sent the kids to different parts of the country before World War II started to create banks because they were really, they were a banking family and they were mm-hmm. really good at, at creating banks. And only one of those banks ended up surviving after World War II because Europe is so decimated that, you know, most of those banks didn't survive. Wow. <laughs> Obviously everything's in love. It was in rubbles. Right. Um, so so in the end, uh, that that one branch, I believe it was maybe in Australia, was then able to um, kind of prop up the rest of the family and, and continue that generational wealth. So it's it's um, it's thinking bigger than yourself. Mm-hmm. I think in today's society, that's um, tends to be a little harder, especially when things are so expensive now. But for you know, we're not, and we're, we're not really talking this podcast probably to every. Americans, we're talking to people who either want to make a change in their family, mm-hmm. or they already have they, they, they've um, created businesses that will generate this wealth for future generations. Yeah, how but, to expand outside your own footprint and impact others? Um, so you know, I think step number one is uh, always understanding um, that you're always building towards something and setting goals. And so, you know, my kids roll their eyes at me, but I make them, my son's really obviously into, into golf. We've talked about this in the past, but uh, every year I make him write down what his goals are for this, for this, this year. Um, my daughter's an equestrian and I'm like, look, we're not driving to horse shows just to drive to horse shows for the fun of it. 
um, we, we, we go to horses have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to write down what your goals are, where you want to be on 12, 31, 23. And then every decision that we make will be based off of, does that help us achieve our goal? Uh, and it really cuts down a lot of the Amazon purchases sometimes for, for the barn <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because um, she has to, she could buy stuff on Amazon. I'll pay for it, mm -hmm. but it has to come through approval for, through me. And then my comment is always, how does this achieve, how does yes. this help achieve our, our goal? Oh, right. I so, like that. Um, one of the horses keeps uh, stepping on his own feet. And so he ripped off a shoe yesterday. Now he's like lame for Aww. like a week until he, and re, yeah. you know, well, you can have covers put on like, their feet. I don't yeah. know exactly term, but that's a good purchase. I'll pay seventeen dollars for the hoof covers because he's done this twice now. Oh, and it, it you know, second time we can't we can't go run a run a show a with a oh, lame horse. So <laughs> that makes sense, right? So seventeen dollars. So spent. it's a, it's the same thing when it comes down to setting your own personal goals. Like, what mm -hmm. are your career goals this year? What are your family goals this year? What is it you want to accomplish? And and does that does that meet that purpose? Right. So in your business, if you're growing a business. And you want to liquidate it someday, you know, what is the purpose? That's a great opportunity to create the trust that you need and funnel assets into the next generation when something like that happens. Um, so that there's, you know, financial success is intentional. That's the theme of our podcast. Mm -hmm. And so this stuff doesn't just happen by accident. You might You're be right. born into it, and that seems a little more like, okay, it's, it's the lottery, right? True. <laughs> but true. if you're the person creating the wealth and you want to change your, your gener generational trajectory, then it's a, it's, a, it's a purpose, and you don't have to be a Rockefeller to do it. You don't yeah. have to own a business to do it. You can just be a really good saver. Exactly. You know, while financial success is intentional, I think families need to realize that it's not always a positive outcome. And during these family meetings, talk about your success, but also talk about your failures and what it is that has come out of that. And maybe talk about amongst yourselves, like how you could better address that the next time and what it is that you have learned from that and how you can make yourself better. Because I feel like in a lot of highly successful families, like the failures just kind of get swept under the rug. Like, oh, no one really saw that, did they? You know, <laughs> right. that didn't happen. But when you're passing down generational wealth, I feel like you have a duty to yourself, to the family, to the money, to do what's right and to address what went wrong and to optimize everything. And don't be afraid or ashamed or upset that something went off the rails, but like that's your biggest chance to right a wrong and to figure out, hey, like we didn't know everything, but let's figure out how to fix it from here. We're smart people. Right. And so that takes away the arrogance out of a lot of it. And that's the biggest stereotype that outsiders will think about generational wealth. It's like, oh, all these people are so arrogant, can't admit that they're wrong about anything. So I think coming at it from a humble perspective and knowing when, you know, maybe we weren't right on that call. So this next time we'll approach it a different way. Yeah. The, um, you also create, have to create a sense of a f strong family unit for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And what I see a lot of times is um, the kids are kind of pitted against each other. Maybe it starts off with just time. You want time with mom and dad, and mm -hmm. then maybe they're not getting that. Um, but ultimately, it comes. It translates into dollars as they get older. It's like they're owed that for some reason. Wow. And, and it's a sense, you have to create that sense of unity where everyone in the family is working together. And, and if one's successful, then either they're all successful or they're happy that the other one is, is being yes. success, is mm -hmm. successful because you're going to do different things. I mean, everyone's going to have different interests. There will be some people in the family that can generate more income than the other, but that's, it's not, that's not what it's really about. And once you establish that, that much multi-generational asset, um, which we should probably talk about what that looks like, um, hmm. then, then, um, you know, that, that kind of supports everyone in, in the group equally. Um, so, on that note, I think you know it's not just stocks and bonds. Mm -mm. I think so many times you, we listen or read read articles that people have written from our industry, and they always assume it's it, the money's in their company, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Build multi multi generational income with with whole life insurance. You know that's not going to happen. 
uh, build multi generational account with my mutual funds or my stock picking or, or what what have you. And we were definitely not um, uh, self serving in, in that in that manner. But I, I like I see it as a, as a multi prong approach. And if you have a family business, it's it's building um, building a successful business. So maybe it's hiring a business coach to to really help you understand how to run and operate and scale a business. Most people can run a business, but they can't scale it. Mm-hmm. That's a very small percentage. Um, it could be taking the profits from the business. So you, you, you take, let's say you have, um, you know, you have 20, 30, 40% profit margin. Where does that money go? Cause you're probably already paying yourself a salary. So the, the profit margin has to go somewhere. So maybe that's in a vacation property, which maybe that vacation property gets traded out for another one or multiple ones. And so those, those properties will continue to grow in value. Maybe they generate income. Uh, because they're they're out there on the rental market, yeah. so those are assets can be passed down and held by the family. Correct? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, imagine uh, it's harder to do that now, but you know, thirty forty years ago, you could pick up rental homes for you know fifty to eighty grand. Right? <laughs> you were the slumlord, yeah. <laughs> but still, um, you know, accumulating that there there's there's a lady uh, involved at at Barry College, one of the the trustees, I only met her a handful of times, but I know people who know her well. I think she has over a um, hundred rental properties, like in Floyd County alone. Like what a great way to pass, pass on generational wealth mm-hmm. because that's all at very low debt or if any debt. Yeah. So that's all yeah. income being passed on to the next generation. Um, and then obviously you, you still have, have to have liquid assets. You can't have all your money in your business. You can't have all your money in real estate. You got to have enough in liquid assets to be able to, uh, maneuver. So obviously a, a trust, a trust account that's well diversified, um, can generate, you know, three, 4% a year very easily today. And that that's not even taking into account growth. Um, yeah. and so that's, those are assets can be passed down. So it's kind of those three areas I feel like, um, is what you're, you're looking to build to then send to the next, um, the next generation. And then how you're going to do that is, is really um, multiple ways. But number one, and we've said this on many podcasts, is you have to tell your story. You have to create a sense of my dad started this business and and he and he um, he was never home. He worked all the time. Yeah. But but he created this for our family and and it's a sense of legacy for us. Mm-hmm. And and we're gonna maintain the business and maintain these values or the business was liquidated and now we own these properties and we have this portfolio and, and, and we're going to, we get an income stream, but the principal is always protected. You yes. know, that, that's, that's the kind of story that you want to, you want to be proud that we're the you, legacy. Yes. Mm-hmm. Correct. And in fact, I was just talking to clients this morning who had a recent inheritance and, you know, they were worried about doing the right thing and this and that. And I said, it doesn't matter. You know, we are going to put together a plan and you are using the inheritance from your dad to carry on, you know, your best life. And your dad, I'm sure, will be happy with whatever it is that you decide to do that's going to make your plan work out the best for the rest of your lifetime. Right. It's, you know, this special gift that he's provided you with that's going to give you relief from your normal life in this rat race. And this legacy that he's bestowed upon your family now gives you the financial freedom to have choices. You know, before it might have been this, you know, more prescribed route towards a traditional retirement. Mm-hmm. But now, you know, you've got more years on your side, more spending on your side, and um, it's truly a gift. And there's not going to be wrong answers. It's just going to be how you go about finding your path. Right. Exactly. A lot of times with inheritance, I, I try to figure out ways to get like real estate paid off. Yeah. Because I feel like that they can actually see it. Yeah, like you know that you know that this house is paid off and it's still appreciating in value. It's not like mm-hmm. you spent it. Exactly. Um, what what I hate doing with it is having to eliminate debt. Oh, the credit card debt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, because yeah, you're never gonna you're never gonna really get that back. And it um, might come back. It, it might come <laughs> back. Yeah, exactly. Obviously, that's not what our target audience uh, is is doing. But 
Um, but yeah, that, that's always sad. I feel like to have to do it, but, but you have to at least give it a shot and I give him a good lecture. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you can do. That's all you can do. Um, all right. So when, you know, there's other ways to preserve, um, this, and this is where it gets more into, uh, estate planning, but it all starts with the story in your mm-hmm. legacy and it's being passed down from generation to generation. The second part is setting up the structure, right? So yes. you can just divide by three. Maybe you have three kids. So you divide by three, it goes to the three kids and you told your story and that's important. Uh, but if you have significant wealth, you really need to go a step beyond that. Um, oh yeah. And, that, and that's to, you know, creating um, the right kind of trust. And there's multiple trusts that you can, you, you can try to, uh, <laughs> navigate through and we, we could do we could do five podcasts just on the, the various trusts and, and how to set those up yeah you know i'm even of the opinion now i just worry about these kids inheriting substantial sums of money really at any age even adult kids with all of marriages gone wrong these days and lawsuits and everything that I'm kind of recommending clients leave money to adult kids in trust, maybe even for perpetuity and letting them name a friendly trustee at an earlier age. And that just keeps the family money in a trust and protected from creditors, um, you know, bad spouses. And it just has that extra layer of protection where they can get it out if they really want to, because they have got a friendly trustee that'll say, sure, you know, buy your Ferrari, that's fine. <laughs> right. But if your wife wants to open like that nail salon, you know, you can say, I'm sorry, my trustee won't let me do that. <laughs> right, exactly. So I feel like, you know, you have to think about that structure, even though your kids are perfect and great, the people around them might not always be perfect and great as they go through the decades. Or they might trust people that aren't trustworthy. Yeah. You know, trying to take your inheritance and put it majority of it in annuities and whole life insurance. Oh, right. They're protecting it. Casey, that's sad. <laughs> it happens, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, no, I, yes, I agree with that. I don't think we see that here as much. Um, you know, I think, couple of cases we're working on now is like a family limited partnership because the business is over the, um, exclusion Ah, and gifting. And and, and so trying to, so basically they're passing down shares to the next family. So certain kids will be operating or directors at the company and some will just be shareholders. Um, so it's getting really creative and, and setting, setting that up, which Mm -hmm. is really kind of another point that we had for our podcast is assembling a team. Um, you need a good financial planner that um, is able to direct traffic and say, okay, this is what the goal and mission is. Now I'm going to bring in this estate business specialist, and then I'm going to bring in the appropriate uh, CPA, which could be multiple, really. If you have a personal CPA versus business CPA, those are two different expertise. Generally, we, our CPAs here we work with are more geared toward the complicated. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to do that as much, but some people do have different CPAs, one for the business, one for personal. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, obviously, um, even like an insurance agent, really, and and you have to keep them in their lane, (laughs) but, but just making sure that, that, um, you've protected your assets. I mean, I think the most common recommendation we're making in our financial planning right now is people don't have umbrella policies. So they have a net worth of five to $10 million, but they don't even own protection past a half million dollars and they have very little debt. So that means that all their assets are up for grab. If there were a terrible accident that they were responsible for. Yes. So you, you want to, you want to be carrying typically your, your household insurance uh, you know, the state farm is all states. They'll stop around 5 million yeah. for an umbrella. Some stop at three. Um, but yeah, it's hard to get five. It's, them. It, yes. So, so I tell them is that you, and I say this very jokingly is like, you worked really hard. You still have common people insurance. You need rich people insurance. <laughs> <laughs> and I hate that word rich, but I use that in, in right. that context uh, just, just to be, uh, provide some humor to the situation. But 
Yeah, there's Chubb, Vault, Pure. Those are all insurance companies that if you have a home worth over a million dollars, yeah. you should not be using Get a away state from farm. the mass market. Correct, correct. The, the, the rest of us who have homes less than a million dollars is different. But yeah. after you pass that million dollar threshold, or if you have um, really nice cars, you should not be um, using your standard insurance. No. Um, so anyway, we have a process for that too. Um, we use Kimberly uh, over at the Dickerson Agency to help us shop for uh, for that. And she can do the high end as well. And then yeah. we also have an agent that we'll use occasionally for um, the ultra high net worth when it comes down to uh, making sure that they're properly insured. And it's not, you're not, you're not looking for cheap insurance at that point. You're just looking for quality of insurance. Oh yeah. The when, you're, when your net worth is, is um, o- over those three, $5 million uh, ranges. So anyway, the point of all that is assembling your team. So who is on your team is your team working in your best interest? Does your team understand what your goals and objectives are? That's that's the important part. And and that's what our roles as financial planners are, is, is to direct traffic and making sure that everyone's moving in the right, right direction. Absolutely. Um, you know, one technique that I see less of these days is just randomly writing annual gift checks. That has kind of dropped off. I've noticed that too. And I don't yeah. know if that's because people want more control or they don't feel like they've got the excess that they just want to freely give away right now. They're holding it I, tighter to the vest. I think it's a COVID result. Maybe that is Where it. we had that big drop in the market. Everyone's worried about their health. You're right. That's when it's <laughs> it dwindled off. Yeah. I think it's a COVID thing now that people aren't writing the... Because you can do 17000 piece yeah so if you have two children mom can write a check for to each child for seventeen thousand. dad can write a check for seventeen thousand for each child and pass it to the next generation now it's a drop in the bucket for most families but yeah it does high net worth it does help um move move money out of one estate to the other and but yeah i think that's because um uh, it people are, are still like kind of in protection mode because mm-hmm. 21 was kind of an adjustment year. And then we had yeah. the big losses in 2022. So no one was, thinking. so no one feels like they can give, get do gifting now. No, They're trying to earn it back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, that's what, again, that's where planners are able to make suggestions. Yes. Um, and it, it's always hard for me to suggest that when they're younger. I know when they're in their you, 50s and you they've just, got yeah, these big cause, estates. Cause and, you just don't know you just don't know what's around the corner sometimes or what the client's going to want to do. Um, but yeah, certainly in, in seventies and eighties, uh, gifting, gifting sort of definitely makes sense. Um, so I guess other ways to protect it. Um, so let's just be blunt about this. I mean, uh, if you have significant assets, you're moving to the next generation, have your kids get prenups. Oh gosh. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, that's one way. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can make yourself the, the bad guy. If you look at the future spouse and say, we love you very much. We're so excited to have you here. But we're also going to protect our, our interest. A business transaction. Correct. Mm-hmm. Um, so having, having children sign prenups would be one. Uh, obviously, you can control some of that through a trust. If it's an irrevocable trust, you can name who those beneficiaries are and what the criteria is for, for withdrawing. Yes. Um, uh, and you can't name, if you don't have a close family friend or a successor to that friend, even uh, Cumberland Trust based out mm-hmm. of Tennessee and Georgia here are great companies to have um, as as trustees. Yes, it's independent not, corporate trustees. Correct. They don't not manage assets, not a bank. They don't manage assets. They, they simply just are the administrators. Uh, and typically you want to make sure you have at least $2 million that would be under their purview yeah. um, to make that worth it. But trustees like that know you as a client, yes. as the beneficiary of the trust, and will make good on yep. everything. I mean, it's amazing what some of those trustees will do. Yep. And then, um, obviously, looking at tax planning for the next generation. So, right now, if you leave a large IRA to the next generation, it has to be withdrawn over a 10-year period. So, if you look down at your kids and you see that your kids are in a very high tax bracket – perhaps it's better for you to do a conversion into a Roth now in a lower tax bracket before it's transferred to them. That yes. protects the, the dollar. 
if they're in lower tax brackets, then the opposite is true. <laughs> you would want to keep it on your side as long as possible. And then once they withdraw, there'll be a tax strategy for them. But having, having multiple generations at a firm also helps. We have several uh, multi-generational families here. And so when I'm working with dad and, and, and I can see the transition, he's ready to transition yeah. out of the business. I can immediately see the, um, uh, what's happening at the kids' accounts and their tax returns. And so you're very able to kind of direct where assets should go versus um, the family being scattered with multiple advisors. Yeah, you're not guessing about tax rates and generations. Correct. It's so helpful. And, and independent advisors, I think for the most part, we play pretty well together. Oh, yeah. But if you're asking me to go to like a Merrill <laughs> <laughs> or an Ever Jones guy, they are going to be super defensive yeah. Super defensive. And they're not going to no, play we, well yeah. or work well. They're not going to work well with independent advisors. We're evidently a big threat to them. <laughs> That's because we do real financial planning. I was going to say because we're doing real work. <laughs> yeah, we're doing real <laughs> work. We're not going to walk in on our project. Not just collecting an assets and a management fee. <laughs> no. Um but yeah, North. I, I had to work with a Northwest Mutual recently, or I tried to, and like the guy wouldn't even take my phone call. So it's it's just really strange how... Um, how that works, where if I called another independent RA, they'd be, they'd be like all buddies immediately. Yeah. <laughs> For the another most part. NAPFA advisor. <laughs> another NAPFA something. advisor, exactly. Like, oh. Working jointly with a family together. That usually goes pretty well. But um, so, yeah, so so having having your team, understanding a tax strategy, um, team also, obviously, I think I didn't mention attorneys, but attorneys oh, yeah. almost show up in every case. Um, but you'd want, you'd want to have an attorney as part of your group that understands what's happening and maybe different multiple attorneys because that same attorney, your corporate attorney is not the same as your, as your estate planning attorney. No, because uh, it might be a life insurance trust for a second to die policy right. to cover some estate taxes. If that's Correct. an issue. Correct. And then I think lastly, I'll add uh, succession planning for your business. Oh, so you're, yeah, you'd know a little, I know, about that. I know a lot about that. <laughs> and I'll say it is one of the hardest things that I, I, I you know, I, I haven't, I have a, uh, we have a rough, rough draft, I guess, but you know, it's, it's really difficult, especially if it's a business like, like ours at Wiser that's, that's growing. And so we're adding great people like you, Missy, but we don't have like, we don't have like that five year track history and, mm -hmm. and, and you're still learning a lot, a lot of things we do here, not the planning side, you got that down, <laughs> but just like the operationally procedures. and procedures and stuff corp corporate wise. And so it's, um, it's very tough. And especially for me, because this is my baby, this is, this is the product. This is a reflection of me, right? This company. And so for any other business owner, it's the same for them. It's not any different. And, and so there, that's where it goes back into um, your counsel for business and, and how you transition that is very different than what um, I would do if I was an employee here. Yeah. So those are, the, but you have to have it in place. Are the employees going to buy the business? Are you going to transition the business to a, a competitor? Is there an, a pre, is there an arrangement? Um, you know, do you have a business broker even picked out? Say, hey, if something happens to me, I want you to broker this business. Uh, I would say you have to make the business as little as about you as possible, which is a whole nother business coaching thing, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> Wait, I think our next episode is, is with Marty Paradise, Paradise Consulting down in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. But, but that whole episode is going to be about how to you know, grow and scale a business um, because that, that's what business owners need. They need to understand that it can't be just about them. No, there's got to be an end game. So in the end, multi-generational uh, wealth can be passed on successfully from generation to generation, but you have to tell your story. You have to uh, have plans in place and be intentional about it, mm -hmm. right? If you're not there, if you don't have multi-generational wealth in your family, there are ways to do it. And it starts with living below your means, staying away from, from debt, right? And building an asset and teaching the next generation about money. And so maybe they can pick up and go from there. Yes. Avoid lifestyle creep and stay educated. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Easy enough. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> um, before we wrap up uh, this episode, Missy, I just want to commend you on a, a job well done. We had 
a person come in recently who uh, was being kicked out of their um, being kicked out of their uh, wealth management firm. And this is guys, this is where I get so frustrated with my own industry, but basically it's a very nice lady who had a good amount of money in her Mm -hmm. brokerage account. Then the money, the advisor took the money out of the brokerage account to buy an annuity for her and a whole life policy. But then the brokerage account depleted down quite a bit because of those two large purchases. And then now he's kicked her off the platform because she doesn't have enough assets under management to be on the platform anymore. But he does, he is keeping the trailing commissions from the two products that he also sold. And this is a local independent uh, financial planning firm is what they have on their website. Very local. (laughs) There's no, I don't think there's any planning done other than his own uh, income planning, but <laughs> personal <laughs> Missy income. has uh, taken the case on and she's done a great job of contacting annuity company and trying to figure out um, what all the options are, which I think we've laid out some options for, for her. But ultimately um, this was all done as this, this was where it hurts. This was all done by a certified financial planner. Mm-hmm. This is a CFP CFP. Certified financial plan. These are the people that are supposed to sign the oath that they're going to do in the be- work in the best interest of the client. And uh, that's not, uh, that's not what happened. And unfortunately, because they're in this broker dealer realm, you'd have to file a complaint through FINRA and the chances of winning are almost zero because probably somewhere along the way, she signed some, some, you know, 5,000 worded small print document that, I know. that cleared them to do all this. Even though it's totally unsuitable. Correct. Correct. Puts her in an awful position now. and So that just, to me, reminds me that fee only is the way to go. This is a fee-based company, meaning that they're supposed to be fiduciaries on one side, mm-hmm. but then when they sell those products, they don't have to be fiduciaries. And who told her, and who told her when he was not going to be a fiduciary and when the sales person yeah, was going to be? No one does that. Can't toe the line, you <laughs> right? Either are or you're not exactly, but that's 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 an error in our uh, structure in the United States anyway, and, and how people can set up their companies. But um, I was gonna say thank you for publicly thank you for um, extending the heart of Wiser in in taking care of her. Sure, we're not out of the weeds yet, but we will get her there. <laughs> that's for sure. We're not gonna leave her hanging. Um, episodes. You might want to listen to episode 152, 10 tax planning strategies for high net worth individuals. Uh, That one may have been with Jordan. Uh, I think that's a good one too. Uh, Episode 128, transferring wealth from generation to generation. I already mentioned episode 117, generational wealth and how to um, preserve it with James E. Hughes. That was a great uh, fast paced uh, podcast we did a while back. Uh, Don't forget, we also have a YouTube channel, a wiser retirement available on YouTube. Uh, we have a couple of videos we linked here, asset protection for high net worth individuals and building a les- legacy beyond uh, financial wealth. Uh, thanks for listening to today's podcast episode. If you're interested in learning more about Wiser Wealth Management or want to schedule a consultation to meet with one of our fiduciary financial advisors, like Missy, you can do so by going to wiserinvestor.com or you can click on the link on the episode notes. Thanks so much, guys, for listening. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced and edited by Ken Hoadley.